Good afternoon, everyone. Whoa, there's a lot of people in here. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'm pretty sure some of you are wondering, who is this guy with a super awesome entry video, right? Well, it's pretty simple. This guy right here. My name is Ntlantlala Kinkosi. I'm a software developer at this really super awesome company that we've come to know as BBD. Some really old people that work for the client that we build software for still call it BBNT. That's when you know that that person has been there for a while. I hold a Bachelor of Engineering Sciences degree, and I'm currently studying towards my BA Honours in Game Design. And both of these from the headache of a university, but also known as Wits University. Right. So why am I here? My mission. Why am I standing in front of all of you today? Well, I'm here to anger every single parent in this room. <laughs> if you're a parent, you've probably told your kids at some point, stop playing with your food. If you're not a parent, you've probably been told to stop playing with your food at some point in your life. Well, I'm here to tell you the opposite. I am here to convince you to play with your food, to play with everyone around you, and basically everything you can get your hands on. <laughs> there was one more point there that I was asked to remove. It <laughs> Well done. <laughs> Through the laughter, I can already see a couple of people thinking, well, how do you expect to do that? How exactly, Mr. Play With Your Food? My plan of action is simple. I have a game that we'll play. However, to play this game, we'll be getting rid of the keyboard, chucking it away, and we'll be replacing it with food, fruits in particular. I've got a couple on my desk that I'll whip out. You'll see. So the next time you see this on your screen, when Microsoft tells you that you can't find your keyboard, please press F1. You don't have to panic anymore. You can just replace your keyboard with the fruit, and you're good to go. Some of your faces right now. Fruit. Yes, we're going to have a very simple game, but we're going to play it with fruit. Every single time I've said this to someone, this is their next question. Why on earth would you want to do that, Lucky? What's wrong with our conventional keyboard? To answer this key question, I have to introduce you to something called human-computer interaction, HCI for short. When I was doing research on this, I watched a really awesome video by this um, professor from the UK named Ellen Dix, except he doesn't say H, he says H. So the entire video, I kept hearing HCI, and it bothered me so much. But nonetheless, here we are, escape. HCI is largely covered in two, or categorized in two different parts. The first is an academic discipline. It's a field of study. And the second is a design principle. As a field of study, people in this field study how computers or how humans interact with computers and the various ways in which we can actually engage with computers. We saw Jerry now showing us how we can actually communicate and engage with computers through image recognition, through cameras. We have our keyboards. This is a study in, or in, in terms of all the ways, the different ways in which you can actually engage with our computers. As a design principle, it's taking what we learn from the studies and actually putting them into practice. All the different ways and what that actually means for the user's experience. But HCI is essentially a culmination of a number of fields coming together, mainly computing, but of course, which includes psychology, sociology, and for a lot of us in this room who work for clients with a very basic bottom line, we needed the field of business and management. But what do we get from HCI? Big data, the big buzzword. There's a talk happening right now in the next room by Michael Apples, who's speaking on big data. Big buzzwords that very few of us actually understand. When you have large quantities of data as we're currently producing as, as this generation, they're worthless if you can't visualize them. They're meaningless if you can't actually put, give meaning to them and understand them. When you look at HCI, we can start coming up with different ways of analyzing our data and communicating it better to the people who need to make decisions based on that large data. We currently have a higher education crisis in this country. We are producing more matriculants than we can accept in higher educational institutions. The next plausible step is to look to e-learning. By enhancing human-computer interaction, we can start providing education to a much larger audience. We can make it cheaper, 
we can make it more accessible. Anytime anyone speaks of HCI, it is said that there's three key words to always mention. When you're building a system that takes HCI into consideration and how humans or people will be interfacing with your technology, three, th three key things that you need to think about. The first, it has to be useful. This is self-explanatory. We want to build software and computer technology systems that are functional, that do the, the right thing every single time. Unlike some software <laughs> that we won't speak about. The next is that it has to be usable. For me, this is at the heart of what human-computer interaction is. It has to be easy to engage with. It has to be fun, not only to use, but also to learn how to use it. It has to be self-explanatory. It has to be intuitive. Professor Ellen Dix speaks of how it also has to be used. Our clients pay us millions of rands to build them software. If no one is using them, then they're worthless. It's the same as just literally throwing money away. But for our software to be used, the first two points have to be achieved. We need to build software that is intuitive, that is easy, and friendly for all of our users in order for them to use it. When they use it, we've now created value. And the more they use it, the more features we can add onto our systems, the more business value we create for both our client as well as BBD. This is essentially what I'm speaking about in one image. We need to move from the interaction between people and computers needing a PhD or a degree in computer sciences. It needs to be intuitive. It needs to feel natural. It needs to be almost as easy and sometimes, I guess, difficult as speaking to another human being. It needs to feel natural. But HCI goes far beyond just being principles and theory and fields of study. We're already seeing a number of technological advancements that actually start probing HCI and how we actually interact with computers. We see it in 3D entertainment. We had 2D games, a sprite that just moved. Then we went, wait, why can't you make this 3D or the perception of 3D? We then went to virtual reality, augmented reality. And we are currently seeing the Internet of Things, as Tony says, becoming the Internet of Everything. And this is really starting to get a lot more people thinking about how we interact with computers and how we can leverage on the different ways we interact with computers to change users' experiences, our experiences, how we can achieve more. As history has taught us, most tech advancements have either come from the military, to kill people, and the entertainment industry, for reasons I don't think I can mention in this room in front of camera. But nonetheless, if we want to be leaders in this field, we need to look far beyond the verticals that our clients operate in. We need to look to other industries and look at all the tech advancements that they use there and actually bring it to our clients. I believe that if your client is asking you for a piece of technology, it's probably already too old. We have systems that are running for 20 odd years now that are using very, very old technology. We somehow keep them running with some duct tape here and there. I see my colleagues laughing in front <laughs> in my PM over there. You know, you've got some VB6 here and there. All of these things that are constantly running. By the time your client asks you, please upgrade this to HTML5, it's probably in the past already, or we're moving far beyond it. So we need to start looking beyond what we're currently using, beyond what our client expects of us to actually add value and to stay ahead of everyone else in the game. One of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein, the significant problems we face cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that creates them. If there's one thing that engineering taught me, it's probably the only thing. In every problem lies an opportunity. There's an opportunity to solve the problem, an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to explore and have fun with new technologies. But I can talk about the theory of HCI all day. When I know that most of you came into this room because you saw play with your food and you wanted to really see what this actually meant. So to really drive the idea of just how simple and easy people can actually get into using or into thinking about and implementing the different ways that we can engage with computers, I'm going to have a very simple demo. We're going to play a game with our fruits. This is me right now. I'm terrified, right? So we've got fruits. Most people in this room have dealt with software. We all know all the problems that can come from 
having software, be it live or not, and my biggest nemesis, circuits. Wow. You sneeze and circuits just stop working, right? I can hear a couple of laughs from people who've worked with circuits before, but this is going to be a, a wild ride. But it will be fun nonetheless. So here's a very simple break, breakdown of our logical flow of the system that we're going to build, that we're going to be building to, today. It's very simple. We're going to have fruits on the table. When I touch the fruit, the system will know that, ah, lucky touched the fruit. But for the system to know that, that fruit has to be connected to a circuit. The circuit will then go to a microcontroller, which will have some software that facilitates our communication. That software will interpret my touching of the fruit, change it to electric current, to actual digital communication. That will facilitate our communication. It will then send that message off to another piece of software that will interpret that and apply it to a game. One circuit, two pieces of software that we're going to write. So, keeping with the flow, the first thing we're going to build, well, I can't really build fruits, so I'm going to build a circuit first, right? So, before you build a circuit, first step, you need to draw your circuit diagram, right? Just as with software, you have to solve the problem first before you code, similar with circuits. You have to design your solution before you can even touch your first resistor. This is the circuit diagram that we're going to be using. It's very simple. That plus five on your top left, that represents our voltage source or our power source. And we're going to be getting that from our laptop over here. As I power my circuit, there we go, right? That is now giving us five volts. That's going to be powering our circuit. From that five volts, I'm going to be connecting a squiggly line, right? It's literally just a wire that I bend like this. No, I'm kidding. That squiggly line represents a resistor, which basically is a resistor. It, it resists the flow of electric current, <laughs> right? That writing on top of the squiggly line, the 1M sign, something, that reads 1 mega ohm. It's basically the amount of resistance, you know, the amount of resistance <laughs> in that <laughs> resistor. <laughs> And from that, we're going to be connecting two things. The first will be a banana, banana, and the next, it says to Arduino analog pin, because I didn't know how to draw an Arduino analog pin to make sense to people. Credit to the image in the bottom over there. Big old wires, big mess of wires, one of my favorite sites to get stuff, including this image. And those three lines at the bottom, oh, it's two. It's meant to be three lines on your bottom left. That represents ground, right? Or as some of you who've broken stuff in your home will know as earth, right? That is basically zero volts. Anything you connect there will give you a reading of zero volts. This is our circuit. I'm going to show you guys how to actually build this, right? But if you see on top of the screen, right in the center, it says to, ana to Arduino analog input, which means that we're going to be using something called an Arduino, right? Now, a couple of things that you need to know before we start using an Arduino. Particularly for our application, we're going to be using the Arduino 6 analog pins. I'll only be using two of them. And what these do is that you're going to plug in a wire. And from our software, we're going to be reading the voltage reading on that wire. Our design is an active low design, which means that all the pins will have 5 volts on them. They're high. In circuits or electronics, we've got two states, high and low, 5 volts and 0 volts. And this is simply because... Now computers, everything we do, whether you're typing an impact assessment, whether you're presenting a PowerPoint, whether you're creating music, playing music, everything that we do on our computers gets converted to ones and zeros. Be it storage, be it the actions that you're firing, they all get converted to ones and zeros in one form or another. But this is all still in the digital space. And as we know, digital space is very magic -y. It's very, you know, fluff. It still needs to exist in the physical space that we're in. And in that space, it exists as electricity. Simple switches, on and off. One, zero, five volts, zero volt. Digital electronics mostly will range between zero and five volts. That's why when you plug in your computer, when you plug in your phone, trying to charge your, your, your phone on your computer, you're also getting that five volts, which is very important. Keep note, I'll be asking questions and giving away prizes, I think, I hope. Nonetheless, we'll be using these analog inputs, particularly the ones that are labeled A0. 
the left, the one that's labeled A5. I'm keeping them away because circuits are full of nonsense. They can interfere with, with each other. There's a whole lot of factors that affect your reading. So I'm keeping them as far away from each other as possible. But we're going to be reading voltage readings from these pins. That's, that's in the physical space. We're trying to control a digital game, which means we need, to, we need a digital understanding of these voltages. So every single voltage reading on that pin is represented by an integer value in the digital space between 0 and 1,023. Right. Can anyone in this room tell me why 0 and 1023? Anyone who can get close to this answer will get a prize. Anyone in the room? 1023, why? What's so special about this? Do you need to raise your hand? Yes. 2 to the power of 10. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Rory. Goes to that guy over there. Yay! <laughs> He's correct. Well, that is actually because on each of these pins, we have a 10-bit analog to digital converter. Very fancy words. Guys, it does very basic maths. All of us here can be analog to digital converters. You can be whatever you want, guys. Right? <laughs> How this works is that we've got 10 bits to represent 5 volts. Right? How do we represent them? We take those 5 volts, we divide them by 10 bits, which is just 1,024 in binary. Right? And that leaves us with 4.9 millivolts for each value. So if I move from 1 to 2 in the digital space, I've just moved 4.9 millivolts higher in the physical electronic space. Simple. Told you, we can all be ADCs if we want to. But let's get to building our circuit. So if you've broken down your computer or your radio or something, you would have seen a circuit board with very tiny things. As you'll see, it's impractical to pick up all of those resistors because they're super tiny. So for prototyping, electrical engineers came up with something they call a breadboard. That's a picture of a breadboard. It's literally a breadboard with nails on them. Because they realize if we keep tying wires together and then untying them, we keep breaking our wires. And wires are expensive, right? Not really, but <laughs> <laughs> it can be a mission. And guys, getting cut from wires is worse than paper cuts. I can promise you. Believe me, I know. So we're using a breadboard, but our breadboard actually looks different from what you're seeing now. I'm going to show you guys what a breadboard looks like, but here's an image of it, right? It's this funny little looking thing with a lot of holes in it. The top part, we call them railings. The one, all the holes that run along the red wire are all connected to each other. Along the blue wire, all connected to each other, as you'll see with the horizontal green block, right? So if you plug in a hole on one end and you plug another uh, and one wire on one end, another wire on the other end, they're automatically connected. You don't have to tie them. It's magic, I tell you guys. And the vertical squares, show you which of the vertical holes are connected to each other. Cool? Makes sense. Now let's actually get to building our circuit, right? So what I've learned from tutoring first year electronics was that people are usually intimidated by circuits. So I'm going to show you guys how I built the circuit. I'd show you diagrams and pictures, but you wouldn't believe me. So I've got a camera today. So this is what a breadboard looks like, as you saw in that diagram. And all these wires look very, very terrifying. But I'm going to explain to you just how simple this is. So on our Arduino board, as I showed you earlier, right, we've got A0 and A5 connected. That's this wire over here, the white wire where my remote control is, and the red wire over here. Those are just from the circuit that goes into our Arduino analog input. Cool. And the gray wire, or I don't know what color it looks on your screen, the gray wire, that's basically our 5 volt power source, right? Our 5 volt power source, which is what we actually care about and nothing else for now, is connected to the red railing over here. Remember we said if you connect it to any uh, of the holes along the red railing, they all get connected, which means we're going to take a look at this portion first because we've built the circuit we showed you guys twice. Essentially, these wires are a mission. So, we're going to have, from that red, we have a resistor that is connected. How do I show you guys that better? There we go. 
Yes. From the red, you'll see that we've got our resistor, our one mega ohm resistor connected from that power, that five volt voltage source, into this thing, into that node over there. We call them nodes because we like naming things, right? So that's a node over there. The red wire, now the red wire is special. The red wire, if you remember our circuit diagram, which is over here, the red wire goes from our node to our Arduino analog input, which we see over here. And the blue wire, well, that's our fruit, as you can see. I just saw Jackie's face going, but where's the fruit, right? Here's the fruit. Yay! <laughs> Simply just going to stick the fruit in. We're going to stick it to the fruit. And then we've got two of these circuits built, essentially. And we're going to stick it to the other fruit. We're going to use a banana and a tomato. <laughs> and there we go, right? So we've now got our fruits. Cool. <laughs> Tomatoes are fruit. Tomatoes are fruit. We've got another fruit here, but yeah, actually, we're going to use this one as well. So if you remember on our circuit diagram, there were those three lines in the ruler, which I say th this is ground. For this to work, or the simple logic in how this works is that the Arduino pin is currently reading 5 volts, right? Because current goes from positive to negative. It tries to move from the plus 5 to ground. It goes along the resistor, experiences some resistance, some fires every now and then, and then tries to go to the banana. The banana has air, there's no way for the electricity or the current to flow. What does it do? It turns around, all of it goes to the Arduino input, right? When we touch ground and we touch the banana, we are now creating a path for the electricity to flow through us. Yes. I won't be touching these myself, I'll be getting members of the crowd to <laughs> test these for us. But we're essentially getting electricity to flow through the banana, through us, to ground. But not all of it, right? It's going to split between us and the Arduino input. So our code is going to read on that Arduino pin and look for the voltage. If the voltage drops, it assumes that someone is touching the banana, someone who isn't me, right? And then we know that, okay, we need to do some action. So back there, I'm going to plug this into our ground, which is in our circuit diagram, a ruler. That's just an orange, I promise. Cool. And now we're here. So, we've now built our circuit. The next step is to build our communication layer. Right, and for that, I have already duplicated my screen. We will be using Arduino. Now, I'm a very brave man. I'm a Zulu man. <laughs> we're very brave. But I, I was not prepared to live code this demo. I've already got circuits, I've already got cameras, so much could go wrong. I decided to pre-write this for you. But I'm going to explain it. It's very simple, only a few lines of code. Right, so when you use the Arduino uh, circuit board, you can write code onto it. Because if you look at the camera over here, it has this fancy, 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 fancy long bus over here. What that is, is a microcontroller. And microcontrollers allow us to write code onto electronics and interface software with hardware. Tell you guys, magic, wizardry. Now, when you use the Arduino, see, I'm live coding. When you create a new sketch, which is essentially a new file with code in Arduino, two functions or methods are written for you automatically. The first is called setup. This, is, this gets called once when your program starts up, and this is essentially where you want to put all your code to initialize variables and communication layers and all of these things. That's your initialization. The next method that gets added for you automatically is your loop method. This, call, this gets called repeatedly. In graphical languages, we'd say it gets called every frame. On my computer, it should be about 60 FPS, so it would get called 60 times every second. So this is where you want to put code that checks for changes in state or voltages or banana touches, you know, stroking of bananas and grabbing of oranges. This is where you want to put all of that code. Right. So the
the very first line sets something I call a threshold to 875. And I'll explain that to you in a second. But the real magic is here. This is our code, right? What I've highlighted. The first line reads, if analog reading on pin A0 is less than my threshold, which means that when someone touches this, the voltage drop on our pin will have dropped below our threshold, which we set to 875 because I'm awesome. I just knew that 875 would be a good threshold to put in, and it works. No, I'm kidding. What I did here is that I basically just output it, you know, debug.log. I outputted all the values on the pin while I touched them, and I monitored, and I put 800, I put 900, I saw it needs a bit of spice, then I dropped it a bit. If you were to do this in a production scenario, if your client wanted banana controllers <laughs> for their banking <laughs> app, you would simply get an electrical engineer to do the maths for you. They would have to calculate the resistance of your fruit, yourself, the carpet, a whole lot of things, but an electrical engineer can do it. Can get any electrical engineer besides me to do the calculations for you. <laughs> awesome. Now, once that threshold, once that reading is below the threshold, I now communicate through something called serial. And you'll see in my startup here that I begin my serial port at 9600. It is essentially the speed that you want your communication to happen. This communicates in bytes. Now, some of you are going serial port. Wait, what? I thought we were replacing a keyboard. Yes. Depending on the board that you're using, you can change the serial communication to actual keyboard strokes. I decided to go this way to show that even with the lower end of Arduino boards, this is probably one of the lowest ends, right, of the, uh, of the Arduino range. You can actually achieve this. But in this, if this was a a much more advanced Arduino board, I would get the keyboard events and fire off left arrow or right arrow. But here I'm just going to use serial communication. What I do is if the reading has dropped below my, threshold, below my threshold, I write literally the number one to my serial port, and I write number two if pin five drops. And these blocks of code are independent of each other. That's why there's no else if. Uh, I see my tech leader going, this guy. <laughs> but yes. Very basic. I then put in a delay just to get rid of any latency or any data that might be there because of circuit latency. Awesome. Now, believe it or not, all of this code takes care of our communication. And we're now just left with our software to implement this. We're getting there, guys. You're about to see the fruits. I promise you. They're going to be awesome, right? Now, I use something called Unity. Yay! Now, I come from a game development background, and I spend most of my undergrad working in Unity. So whenever I need to build any prototype for anything, I use Unity. Use Unity. It's good for you. Right. But here's our very basic game, which I kind of built during a deployment while I was waiting for things to break. So. Our simple game, you have a spaceship with four thrusters that depending, so if I press on, if I press the left arrow, it, you know, thrust on the left, right arrow, thrust on the right. And the mission of this game would basically be to work with other people to land this safely on the different platforms. Awesome. Left, right key. There we go. Now, to really test this, I need to actually stroke the banana, right? So. <laughs> What I've done here is I've written code to take care of the communication. Um, I've got a colleague. His name is Steven. Anytime I tell him about anything, he's like, yeah, but show me the code, right? <laughs> so I'm going to show you guys just a bit of it. This is written in C Sharp, and I'm just using ports. All I'm doing is I'm initializing a new serial port. This number, identical to the number I used there to start my serial port communication. So this will be communicating the one and two, and this portion of the code will be reading the one and two. So I start that at 9600. Start is exactly the same as setup over here. It runs once in the beginning, and it's where you want to put all your initialization code. Awesome. All I do there is I open the serial port. Hi, can I have some data, please? Cool. We then set our read timeout to one second, because you don't want to go 
Can I have some data, please? And while we're waiting for a response, you keep waiting and waiting while no one is touching the fruits, right? Because then your system will freeze, right? Or they say it doesn't respond, you know? Or the famous term, it hangs. The application is hanging. We also have this method called update. An update is exactly the same as the loop here. It gets called every single frame, so it would be called 60 times every second. That's quite fast to check for any changes in data, right? And, and here we basically check if our serial port is open. So if we've knocked on the door and opened and we're asking for data, right? We say, please give us data with this method called read byte. And we know that we're expecting either one or two if it's our system that's communicating on our channel. We read that value. If there is no value, we time out after one second. So six, 60 times in a second, we're going to be checking this. We time out, we throw an error, we catch it because we want our code to continue. Cool. If we do get a value, however, we then move our object with that value. I've also printed out, or I am printing out all the values as we read them. And I just realized I haven't tested this today, <laughs> which is interesting. Would anyone like to come and help me test this? One, two, two people. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> so, on your left, you'll see our camera to prove that I didn't pay them a bribe. There was no brown envelope exchange. There we go. Right. Now, you need to touch the orange, right? And one of the banana. other fruits. Okay, touch I the... Like banana. Hold the orange and stroke the <laughs> banana. <laughs> Can hold the orange with one hand and stroke the banana on the other. Keep holding it. You need to stroke it, apparently. Oh, wait. This is not even running. Just a second. Okay, <laughs> cool. There you go. You'll see that as, as he touches the banana and the orange at the same time, he's constantly, well, we're constantly printing the value one, which means that he's touching the first fruit. And our system is actually picking up that he's touching the first fruit. Cool? Now, DK, would you like to test our next fruit? So if you grab the orange and the tomato, it should be printing out the value two, right? But our spaceship is doing funny things. Eh? It's not even moving correctly. Right. But we can see now that we're actually picking up the communication from our fruits and our circuit. Right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs> Big round of applause. <laughs> Woo! So what is wrong? I honestly have no idea. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. All we have to do, so our ship currently has four thrusters, and we're only using two controllers. So I just have to double up on the power on the juices that I'm giving them, ah, let's just triple it. An accurate representation of a developer at work. Trial and error. And now you'll see that we're getting much stronger movement from our spaceship, right? And I can even make it move. Notice how when I got it to move, the camera was off. <laughs> stay, <laughs> stay woke, stay woke. No, I'm kidding. It actually... <laughs> it actually works, I promise. I'll show you. An no, I'm kidding. Okay, so... Here we go, right? Let me just reset this so we can see it not die and crash and do all of these things, right? So I grab the orange. Remember, this is meant to be our ruler. This is, what, this is connected to ground, so this is how we're creating a path for the circuit or the electricity to flow. Touch my banana, it moves on the left. I touch my, well, yeah. I'm a better driver of cars. I, 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 <laughs> I promise. <laughs> So now, I'm going to touch both fruit, and that's how I got it to actually move up, right? And there you can see I'm while touching the orange, and that's essentially how we're moving this, right? So we've seen, there we go. So we've connected our fruits, we've touched them, we've stroked them. Thank you, Prasad. We've built our circuits, we've written our software to facilitate the communication. We've implemented that onto a game. Now, we had a mission when we started, right? The mission had three things. We had to play with our food, which we've done. 
we had to play with some people around us, right? <laughs> and we had to play with everything we could find around us. I've got a camera. I was very scared of using this camera. Clickers, microphones, there's a whole lot that could have gone wrong today, but nothing did, right? Which is amazing. Given all of this, I think it's pretty safe to say that mission has been accomplished. <laughs>